Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for coming to um, uh, the um, GRASP seminar and then also an SSU forum. Um, um, so many acronyms here. And Graduate School for Public Policy and the uh, Security Studies Unit for the Institute for Future Initiatives. Um, we have a regular program um, virtually, um, more or less, um, every month. Um, and, um, and today's speaker is um, Dr. David Laheni um, of Waseda University. Um, allow me to sit down here. Um, got my back pains. Oh, um, uh, uh, for, before I forget, I'm, I'm Kichi Fujibara, uh, who would be the moderator um, of today's meeting. Uh, now, um, it is really, really my privilege and pleasure to introduce um, Professor Leheny uh, because uh, not, only, um, not only because he's a great scholar, but because um, he is such a dear friend of mine. I'm very proud about that. Um, I was thinking how I can introduce uh, uh, Leheny san to you. Um, just to show his credentials, and, and he studied at Cornell University, received a doctorate there. Um, and the, the, the main advisor, I believe, um, is uh, Dr. Peter Katzenschein, uh, who was one of the speakers for our forums. Um, and um, before he finished his um, uh, um, thesis, um, he was uh, um, in our campus at the Institute of Social Science, where he came back uh, later on and after um, uh, after Cornell and he taught at the Wisconsin uh, University of Wisconsin Madison campus and then moved to Princeton University and um, it I was so frustrated when Waseda University got him instead of us really damn it um, um, his works uh, are, um, are many. Uh, the first work is the rule of um, play, uh, national identity and the shaping of Japanese ledger. And the second work, uh, which is um, very well known, um, titled Think Global, Think Global, Fear Local, it's about, well, terrorism, but that's not a way to describe this word, the work. And then the third work um, is Empire of Hope. It's a bizarre combination of topics. Um, his, uh, his first book, based on his dissertation, is about ledger. But this is not really about ledger policy. This is not a promotion for Japanese ryokans or hotels or whatever. Uh, this is more about ledger policy as one way to look at the definition of national identity in Japan. Um, it's a tall order, and he pulls it off magnificently. And in his second book, uh, Think Global, Fear Local, which is a uh, book about terrorism, uh, is one that in, uh, includes discussion about, say, for example, Enjo Kosai. Now, who would think, um, uh, would write about Enjo Kosai, uh, uh, juvenile prostitution, uh, in a book about terrorism, but he does it magnificently, along with, with his discussion about Omo Shinrikyo. And others. And in all these works, his focus was essentially on how the Japanese think of, them, think of themselves, how the Japanese represent themselves uh, to be, and the gap between the self image and uh, what Japan is. Now, this is a tricky place, really, because um, on the one hand, these discussions can easily um, develop into such arguments like um, why are the Japanese like this, right? And uh, with a condescending attitude to the cultural bias that is shared by the Japanese in their self-image, which has little relationship with, with reality. We see so many articles uh, written along that line. And then, of course, uh, we can also see uh, a an, an militant uh, multiculturalist and defending the uh, legitimacy of each views based on each cultural community. David doesn't do either. And, and he has been 
um, um, immensely successful in having a balanced view and yet not glorifying uh, culture as such. Um, so um, this is something that he has achieved even better in his book, uh, the, oh yes, I was supposed to do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah well, there, there's a hard copy, yes, I, I have both. Uh, this book um, with this, uh, <coughs> this um, picture you can see down, down there, um, Prime Minister Abe in the Rio Olympics and with uh, Super Mario Brothers. Um, and see how David discussed about this. So um, I, I talked much. So, so without further ado, I just want to tell you that you're in front of a great master. So enjoy. David. Wow. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. That's, that's about, is this on? Can people hear me? Or this is, that was about the most generous introduction um, I've ever received. And I'd like to thank Professor Fujiwara um, for, for it and also for inviting me. Um, I should note, I, I did start my career here at Todai uh, uh, in the Shikai Kagoku Ken Kyujo as a, as a Joshu at the time. And um, one of my senior colleagues was the young, dashing, uh, extremely promising young international relations scholar, Professor Fujiwara, uh, who was one of my, became one of my dear friends at the time. Um, and so after my two years working there finished where I'd, I spent most of the time running our, our uh, English language magazine called Social Science Japan, translating the articles, printing it. Like I, I found that the, the two things I could say that I, had, I could do that I'd really sort of pulled off were number one, I could negotiate a printing contract in Japanese, uh, which isn't much, but it ain't nothing either. So I was happy about that. And, and the second one was that I could tell people that I was friends with Professor Fujiwara, which opens more doors around the world than you can possibly imagine. He's one of the most respected scholars uh, anywhere in the world. And to be able to drop his name, whether uh, in Japan or in Tokyo at Gaimasho or at, at another university, at the Wilson Center in DC, among my colleagues at Princeton, um, at any of these places, it was, always, it was always a much more successful way to open doors than offering to, to translate uh, uh, printing contracts in Japanese was. So I was immensely grateful to him. Um, it is very nice to be back here and have the opportunity to talk about the book. But I also want to thank two other people today. Um, uh, Imamura-san, who uh, worked incredibly hard to get me to submit all the necessary materials and, uh, and also worked with me on them immensely hard. I'm very grateful to her for everything she did to make this uh, possible for today. And also, um, finally having had a chance to meet uh, Hanai Kazuyo sensei, who I did not know is now an assistant professor here at the Institute. She actually um, provided an image that I talk about at the opening of chapter three of my book. And the, the chapter is really too grisly and upsetting for me to show. Also, I don't have copyright over it, but it was actually really important for thinking about this chapter. So I thank her in the book, but I've never met her. We, we, I, we were introduced through her former professor, uh, Professor Sato Jin, who's uh, here at Todai and, and a good friend. And so um, without her, the, the chapter that I'm going to talk about today uh, would have looked very, very different. And so I'm extremely grateful to her for having helped me out even without, without knowing me. Um, so um, with that, I'll, I'll start my talk. I should note as well that um, when I feel nervous or threatened, I tend to speak too quickly. Um, so if, uh, if I am speaking too fast or if you would like me to repeat something, please don't hesitate to raise your hands and, and let me know. Um, but try not to look angry because that will make me feel uh, only more nervous and threatened and I'll probably speed up again. Um, so this book itself, um, let me just make sure I understand the buttons. So this book um, really emerged out of an effort to uh, deal with debates about emotions and international relations theory. I was initially doing the case studies for the book for, in, for different articles, but I started reading a lot of work about how emotions are affecting politics. And it's been a, an increasingly prevalent debate in the English language literature. Um, scholars uh, like Jonathan Mercer, Netta Crawford, uh, Rose McDermott, my good friend Todd Hall, um, who I think spoke here uh, about a year ago or two, uh, that they've all written really, really good pieces of research about how emotions can affect politics and international relations. And as you can see below, the ballooning research in this area has produced a variety of really excellent works. Um, Albert and Guderian's book, uh, Ancient uh, Anxious Politics, 
Mixed Emotions by Andrew Ross, uh, Todd's own book, Emotional Diplomacy. And these are all very important contributions, but I found that none of them really helped me get a handle on what emotions themselves are, partly because for the purposes of social science, they had to strip down emotions to really basic forms, just to make them useful for some kind of variable-based analysis. And in fact, when you read this literature, emotions that affect politics are usually anger and fear or anxiety. Basically, those two are the ones that dominate this field. There's occasionally some other emotional frames brought in, but mostly it's anger and fear and anxiety. And we can understand that. Like, it makes sense. And when we think about emotional moments in politics, we think about protests in China or Korea against Japan for the comfort women issue or for the Yasukuni visits or so forth. We think about the anger of Donald Trump voters who are angry at a country that seems to be moving away from the sort of historically white dominance of the nation and so forth. And it makes sense that that's what we would key into. But our own emotions aren't that simple. None of us have emotions that can be narrowed down quite that, that narrowly. And in fact, there's a tendency to, in this literature, to try to code a relationship between an emotion and an outcome that's very momentary. Like if I make you mad, I can predict how you'll behave maybe for the next minute or two, but after that, other things will happen. You will start to have different emotional reactions. You'll think about what you're supposed to do. You'll think about how you're supposed to feel. You'll think about how people are judging you and how other people would react. I'm gonna do the same thing. And it means that we can make a behavioral argument but perhaps not a very political one. Now, scholars who have tried to think through emotions in, a, I think, a more complex way have mostly been in anthropology and literary studies using something called affect theory. Affect theory is, of course, a, a, an important theoretical contribution that emerged mostly from literary studies, but has used, been used productively by such a famous anthropologist as Kathleen Stewart in her classic book, Ordinary Affects, Sergei Ushakin in his book, The Patriotism of Despair, about, about Russia. Um, and Allison's book, a Precarious Japan, is another excellent example. And these works, I think, try to take the idea that feelings circulate among people and have consequences quite seriously. But the problem for me was that I couldn't then make a leap to politics in any direct sense, to think about how things happen in politics. And so what I ended up doing in the book was to rethink emotions through the form of narrative. Because the way I started to understand it was that emotions take on a certain force in politics because of how they're represented, how we talk about them, and how certain people, government officials, activists, leaders, opinion writers and newspapers, authors, have the authority to say how we're supposed to feel. We Japanese are proud. We Americans are angry. We Chinese are sorry. We Germans regret. We something, but we collectively have some sort of feeling. And that this becomes an important way in which politics works, right? Through the, through the expression, both by officials, but also by other private citizens of how everyone in a community is supposed to feel. And I'm not the only person to have noticed that. Uh, Roland Bleak or Emma Hutchison, two very fine scholars from Australia, have made a similar argument. Mar Martha Nussbaum, the great political theorist at Chicago, says something similar. But what the political scientists haven't really done with this is to think about what a logic of representation looks like. If we move away from the idea that emotions themselves are the driving force, that we should instead think about representation, then we have to try to understand a logic of representation. Why are things represented in certain ways? How does representation work? And the scholars who work on representation have mostly been in literature. Most famously, Peter Brooks, the great scholar, worked for decades at uh, Yale before moving to Princeton a few years ago, which is when I was exposed to his work. Um, his classic work, The Melodramatic Imagination, was one of the most important uh, expressions of this body of work uh, in literary theory. Reading for the plot was a similarly important contribution that essentially tries to think about why certain structures of narrative, why certain stories that we tell ourselves end up shaping how we experience the world. So much so that it becomes impossible for us to understand the world without thinking about the narratives that shape how we're supposed to behave and how we're supposed to react.
there's a lot of talk of narratives, at least in English language accounts of politics, and it's usually very agent oriented. Someone tries to shape the narrative. A political figure tries to describe the narrative or shape the narrative. But that kind of sets the storyteller above the material and above the audience. And I think it's more participatory than that. And I also think it's more encompassing than that. So partly what I'm going to do today in talking about the book is to think about how a certain, set, a certain larger community narrative about Japan has shaped what can authoritatively be, be said about how we Japanese feel. Now, thinking about narrative, I tried to think about the narrative of post-war Japan as a, a story of the long post-war. And it's, it's a story that I'm not the only person to have noticed. I mean, if anything, I'm building off of the work of a large number of, of important historians and, um, and cultural studies scholars, scholars in Japan like Narita Yuichi, scholars in the United States like Carol Gluck, who have argued that the post-war itself has become an overwhelming narrative of Japan's collective effort to rebuild its economy from the ashes of defeat through success that built the economy together where we collectively did this, a version that gets romanticized in movies like the Always Sancho Yuhi series, in which you see a group of lovable goofballs in Tokyo sort of following their own dreams, but also being committed to and proud of the extents to which Japan is which we see here through the building of the Tokyo Tower in 58, comes together as a moment of collective success for everyone. And you can see versions of this in the Project X series on NHK, and it, these have been widely discussed and criticized by cultural studies scholars in Japan as well as, um, as, well as overseas. I'm not suggesting that everyone believes this story in exactly the same way. What I am suggesting is that if you base an account of post-war Japan on this basic story, it's taken more or less for granted as natural, the same way that in the United States. If I tell a story about how America itself is always striving for and is always achieving greater elements of liberty, that we're always moving towards more liberty, that our struggles and our successes are always by creating more human freedom and liberty, that's a story that can be told about the Revolutionary War can be told about the Civil War. It can be told about the Civil Rights Movement. It can be told about the Gay Rights Movement in America today. And it's one that is not in itself questioned, even if it has to cover up a much larger set of complex issues in America's relatively unfree history. So in any case, to get to where the book is, um, the book itself is comprised of seven chapters. I'm going to focus on chapter three today. I'll explain in a moment why. But um, the first chapter is uh, Maybe They Will Smile Back, which uh, is a title I take from this movie, Bokutachi wa Sekai Okai de Kotoga Dekinai, But We Want to Build a School in Cambodia. It's not a great movie. It's fine. It's, has anyone seen it? Has anyone seen this movie? It's not super popular. They show it at a lot of JICA events, actually. Um, it's, it's direct, it was written by, um, it's based on a book written by uh, a, a former medical school student, um, uh, Hatakoda, who had in fact, who played here by the charming and handsome Mukai Os Osama. Um, and he, you know, sort of feels empty in his life and he gets together with his friends and they raise money and they build a school in Cambodia. So the title of the movie kind of gives away the plot, like spoiler alert, don't read the title. Um, but it's also directed by uh, Fukusaku Kenta, the son of the legendarily great uh, director Fukusaku Kinji, um, one of my heroes, and I assume one of Professor Fujiwara's heroes as well. Um, and I take it from this because this movie itself not only tells a story about post-bubble Japan, but it's a story that really makes sense because of a larger background story about Japan that helps to uh, clarify Japan's relationship with its Asian neighbors, including Cambodia. The second chapter is the chapter I spoke about in the last time I was here at Todai a few years ago when Professor Fujiwara invited me. Uh, and that's Souls of the Ehime Maru. And this is an analysis of the Ehime Maru uh, uh, accident in 2001 when an American nuclear submarine struck this uh, fisheries training vessel from below, uh, sank it within five minutes, and killed nine people, including four high school students from, uh, from Uajima Fisheries High School. I'll, Briefly touch on that as well. Chapter three, Cheer Up Vietnam, uh, discusses the case of uh, Nguyen Viet and Nguyen Duc, uh, the uh, Bet Chan and Duc Chan, uh, 
who I, I think most of the audience members will be familiar with. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, there was a book written about them by a group I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, um, Gambari Betschan Dokchan, which was translated into English as Cheer Up, Viet and Duk. Sorry. Chapter four is Cool Optimism. It deals with Japanese um, pop culture and so the Cool Japan initiatives, but I take the title from Lauren Berlant's now famous work of affect theory, Cruel Optimism, in which she sort of uh, analyzes the affect of, of late capitalist society as being a desire for, um, for that which harms us through our attachments to it. Chapter five is Staging the Empire of Light, which an analyzes narrative by looking at a theater group uh, in Tokyo, actually created at Waseda, uh, Car Caramel Books. Caramel Books has been around since the 1980s this is one of their plays, Hikari no Teikoku, which is based on a short story, Okina Hikidashi, by the, um, the now Naoki Show winning author, Ondariku. Um, and I analyze how a certain repeated narrative structure in Caramel Box plays forces them to rewrite elements of this story in order to work for the audience. And the point of that is to remind ourselves that narratives are often enforced upon us. And to think about how a repeated narrative can actually take on a, a special emotional set of needs for the audience. Chapter six is uh, Hope as the New Normal, in which I talk about the Kibogaku project, um, which was done here at, and still on, on, ongoing, at the Shikaikaku Kenkyujo, especially the work they did in Kamaishi. That's uh, Kamaishi East Junior High School, which was the site of Kamaishi no Kiseki, where um, eight, uh, about 700 uh, junior high school students uh, escaped from the tsunami. And then the final chapter uh, is Everything Sinks. Uh, it's a title I take from uh, one of my favorite novellas in Japanese, Nihoni Gai Zenbu uh, which is the, uh, which is a satire, Tsutsui's satire of, of, um, of uh, Nihon Shimbotsu, the sort of neurotic, overwritten, science fiction book about, the, uh, about Japan sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And I use this to think about how a certain narrative about Japan is now being used to explain the problems for other advanced industrial countries too. That it's not just Japan, but other countries are now facing budgetary uh, problems. Other countries are also facing energy problems. Other countries are also facing demographic challenges so that Japan is a quote unquote problem pioneer. The key arguments of the book are that um, the recognition that rationality is embedded in emotion, which is a central tenet of the new political science work and the subject, is helpful, but it militates towards experimental methods and reflexive outcomes that shorten time horizons and call into question the meanings of the political. That they, they focus a little too much on, if you have an emotion, what will you do immediately afterwards, rather than thinking about the consequences for broader debates about politics. Second argument uh, the expressions of collective emotion simultaneously define the boundaries of a political community. They discipline its members, so they, they tell us what it's appropriate for us to say or feel. And they shape legitimate experience of the political world, even if they help to conceal the divisiveness of politics, that they, they make the political non-political. They talk about how we're all supposed to feel the same way, even about things that might divide us. And they reinforce a sense of community, that if we, I think, therefore I am, we feel, therefore we are. Um, as other scholars like Emma Hutchison and Roland Bleeker have noted, the key issue should be representation of politics. And if that's the case, the logic should switch from a logic of emotion to a logic of representation. Okay. So the last time I was here um, at the Institute for Future Initiatives, which I think was not what it was called at the time, it was, right, it was policy alternatives at the time, but I, I love the new logo, so I wanted to include it. Um, I talked about the chapter on the Ehime Maru case, and the focus of the Ehime Maru chapter is to really track how the United States and Japan together solved this crisis, mostly by having the United States raise the boat from the bottom of the ocean in an expression of respect for the feelings of Japanese people about needing the bodies back. And in the chapter, I point out that actually d Japanese and American policies on bodies are extremely similar, that the history of these debates in both countries is extremely similar, but we see at this time an effort to radically differentiate the way Americans feel about death and the way Japanese feel about death in order to create an opportunity for overcoming a cultural difference. 
that doesn't really exist. And that if anything, this expression of unified emotional reactions to death among Japanese or among Americans concealed the differences between those who were actual victims of the accident, the family members of the, 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 the boys and young men who were killed from the broader community. Um, and so I argued that political representation of emotion tells us far more about politics than about emotion itself. Um, and that's why today I want to talk a little bit more about national narratives and the construction of events, how events are understood in a larger structure. Now, as I noted before, you can see versions of this, just a version of this national story in something like the Always Santoma and Yuhi movies. And, you know, in the United States, I could talk about Forrest Gump as being a great example of this in, in, in the way we kind of understand American history. Project X is another excellent example in which every week during the show, which was, of course, widely watched, although also widely mocked in Japan, um, every week during the show, they would have vignettes of engineers or workers or factory members who would get together to, to create some kind of innovation that would propel Japan into the future. And there were rarely individual heroes. And there were rarely larger political structures that affected people, and rarely an international context in which their actions made sense. Rather, outcomes happened the way they do in a story, because the key characters, the key leaders, together worked together and achieved something. And that story itself is one that gets repeated enough that it's a fairly easy thing to point to as a common or widely at least shared understanding of, uh, of post-war Japan, as the Japan that, as the country that collectively worked together to rebuild itself from the ashes of war, to become a scientific, economic, and technological leader that well, even while under the thumb of the US alliance, would also especially be a leader to the other countries of Asia, and especially able to lead the other countries of Asia toward their own path of development, scientific revolution, and overall social transformation. Oh, sorry, I, I, I tried to cut this out, but my efforts to redo my slides at the last minute didn't work, so I apologize for doubling up. So in talking about this, I wanted to bring, back, uh, bring us back to uh, the story of Bets Chan and Dok Chan. Um, I think most of the people in the room know this story quite well. Uh, certainly, if you were in Japan during the mid-1980s, it would have been impossible to miss this. It was one of the top stories in the news from about 19, early 1986 until 1989. Um, and it's, of course, a legacy. The story is a legacy of the Vietnam War, a war in which Japan was implicated by its alliance with the United States, even though there were massive protests led by the Haida and against the war within Japan. And certainly among many members of the Beheda and generation, there was a lot of feelings of guilt or expressed feelings of guilt that we didn't do enough to stop our government, to put its foot down, to stand up against the United States and say, you will not use our bases on our territory. You will not use our support to carry out a brutal violence war against other people in Asia, a brutal violent colonial war and other people in, uh, other in Asia. The war itself, of course, was a traumatic experience for the United States in some ways, but utterly catastrophic, not only for, for, for Vietnam, but for Cambodia and Laos as well. The, as most of you know, the amount of violence done to these countries by the United States military was just biblical in scale. There's been nothing in human history that could you could compare the Vietnam War to in terms of the amount of violence that was carried out. Um, the protest against the Vietnam War, led by Beheiran, tended to make explicit connections between wartime Japan and wartime Vietnam in the sense that in both places you have civilians who are being victimized by overwhelming levels of American force. And for many of these leftists, they weren't in any way trying to conceal the imperial nature of Japan's war. But what they were trying to do was point out that, especially as victims of war, especially because we know what American bombing campaigns can do, we should be especially vigilant in protecting Vietnam from suffering the same amount of violence that we ourselves suffered. And in the aftermath of the war, the idea that Japan lost its war but won its peace, whereas Vietnam won its war but remained mired in economic problems and in, uh, and, and, and in subjugation, 
led a number of these activists to believe that Japan should be contributing more to, to help Vietnam. Um, so the anti-war protests in 1968 were part of a larger set of struggles, as, as many of you know, against the government and other formal institutions, but the Haydn was, of course, a key part of that. Now, the backgrounds to thinking about Betschan and Dukchan themselves is to recognize that the United States, of course, heavily sprayed Agent Orange, the chemical defoliant uh, com throughout central and, and southern Vietnam. This was the chemical weapon the United States used in order to destroy forests so that we could bomb uh, communist supply lines more easily, both North Vietnamese as well as guerrilla uh, lines. This particular set of chemicals, collectively called Agent Orange, were judged to be probably dangerous, but that information was concealed both from the soldiers, the American soldiers in Vietnam, and certainly from the international community. Certainly no one about in Vietnam was really told about it. But in the aftermath of the war, the consequences of these weapons became more clear. They create terrible neurological problems. If you're exposed to them, you yourself are likely to have terrible health effects. But the consequences are especially severe for the uh, children born to parents who have been affected by this. So Betschan and Dukchan were born uh, in 1981, eight years after the United States withdrew from the war, but the area in which they were born was still saturated with the remnants of the, these chemical weapons. Um, they were abandoned very shortly thereafter by their mother. They were conjoined twins, conjoined uh, at, at the waist, sharing a number of organs. They had three legs between them. Um, and they were abandoned by their, their mother who couldn't take care of them. The father had deserted the mother shortly after their birth. And they were brought to uh, the hospital after that. They were born in Kontum province. And they abandoned the children at a local hospital. They were initially called Ba and Bon, uh, basically three and four, uh, or as I say, Saburo and Shiro. So not terribly strange names. Um, so they're called Ba and Bon, but shortly thereafter, they're moved to the, uh, the Germany-Vietnam Friendship Hospital, a hospital created by the East German government in support of Vietnam during the war. And uh, Ben Vien uh, Hu Nui Viet Duc. Uh, Viet Duc, of course, Vietnam and Germany, and that becomes the two boys' names. So the boys themselves are seen, even within Vietnam for a short time, as being ex political uh, expressions of some sort of international cooperation. Eastern Germany was not able to do a whole great deal for the boys in the aftermath of that, especially given the um, other pro problems facing the Japanese, fa facing uh, East Germany at the time. So it fell to Japanese to take the lead. Now, one of the people who became most important of this was uh, Nakamura Goro, who's a photographer. He never quite became as famous as somebody like Asawara Kyohei or as Ichinose Taizo, who were both legendary Japanese photographers of the war who were both killed in, in Cambodia in the waning days of the war. But he did return. He survived the war and he did return a number of times after leading a career taking photos of the consequences of war to publish this book. Uh, m uh, my mom, mother drank or mother ingested uh, 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 Agent Orange, kind of has I, uh, dioxins. And it's about the ecological and human consequences of this. And Nakamura was, of course, a critic of the war who wanted to focus upon the lingering consequences after the war to the Vietnamese of what the United States had done to the country. And he initially finds the boys in the hospital, takes photos of them, and they're publicized within Japan. And shortly thereafter, other Japanese activists start to become interested as well. Uh, Dr. Fujimoto, who is a uh, physician from Shiga Prefecture, had a fellowship to go to Vietnam. He stays in Vietnam for about a year and works with the boys, partly, as a, partly in order to promote a focus on how war affects disabled people or the consequences of war for disabilities. They're joined by another figure from Shiga Prefecture, uh, Kawahara Masumi, who uh, Mr. Kawahara was him, is himself disabled and was in a wheelchair and was the first uh, disabled wheelchair confined individual to, to win employment through a court case as a public librarian in Japan. 
And so he himself was a leader of disabled rights activities. So these three people themselves are committed to the boys, but they also have larger political goals or concerns. They're all progressive, or what we would today call progressive in, our, in, in their political views. And together, they created this group, the Betschan Dokchan no Hatatsu Nagaokai, or the group hoping for, praying for the development of Viet and Duk. And they organized themselves as an organization to help these two boys, to publicize their plight within Japan, to raise money for them within Japan, to help them out. And the first thing they do is pretty remarkable. They, they actually hire one of their members, or they get one of their members, a disabled engineer, to design a special wheelchair that they can use. Up until that point, they couldn't fit into a regular wheelchair, so they were forced to crawl around the hospital on the floor. So this engineer designed a special wheelchair that they could themselves propel to get down the hallway themselves and be pushed around. Um, they began to work more extensively with uh, the, the leader of the hospital that they were in in Vietnam. Uh, Dr. Fong, who became kind of a celebrity within Japan because of her work with them. Uh, Dr. Fong became one of the most important advocates for victims of Agent Orange. She actually organized international conferences, bringing in specialists not just from Japan, but even from the United States, Soviet Union, East Germany, other countries, to study the effects. Now, as you can imagine, especially back in the 1980s and 1990s, these particular conferences were not particularly welcomed by the United States government. But American physicians did take part, especially if those physicians were, like their counterparts in Japan, progressive anti-war critics. So many of them came over in order to, to study what we had done to, to Vietnam as a result. Now, in 1986, as, uh, this is where the story becomes famous in Japan, and I, I imagine many of you remember this story quite well. Um, Viet, the older of the boys, by two minutes, uh, Viet comes down with encephalitis, which is uh, brain fever. His brain begins to overheat. And the doctors become concerned that in Vietnam that we can't control the fever and it's going to kill both boys. So the, the Nagaokai works together with the Japanese Red Cross to organize a trip for the boys to Japan to receive medical treatment in Tokyo which they successfully do. And in fact, this is really in some ways how they then become well known enough that they can publish this book, Gambari Bets Chan and Chan, which documents the work that the organization did with them. But this wasn't just a group of pro progressive, progressive activists. The mass media became intimately involved in publicizing the story and even Prime Minister Nakasone, not a progressive left-wing critic of, of Japan's militarism, but a very conservative nationalistic leader, became quite expressive about helping the boys. He dispatched his own airplane, the Japan Airlines plane used to bring the prime minister to, to international meetings. He sent it off to Vietnam to pick the boys up and then took credit for it in this, this speech. Uh, for those of you who don't read um, Japanese, well, I imagine most of you do, um, he basically said that you know just recently we had the issue with the two boys um, from Vietnam, that's Chan Duk Chan. Um, he was in the middle of a, pre, uh, a campaign when he said this, by the way. He says, um, everyone was just wringing their hands at some point. I said, Uroro shite tota. I don't know how to translate that, but everyone was just like, you know, not doing anything. Um, and didn't, couldn't get their act together, but I was the one who was decisive. I made the decisions, um, and I was the one who brought them over, and now they're doing better, aren't they? And this is what we're supposed to do, not just as Asians, but also as humans. This is natural for us to do it, but we need a prime minister with speed, someone who's decisive, someone who makes these decisions on behalf of these boys. So he links the idea of humanism, which of course is something that the progressives are pushing, to his own decisiveness as a prime minister, which is sort of exactly what the many progressives hated about him, was his own kind of quasi-dictatorial tendencies. He links these together as his own contribution. Now, what this does is in some ways, it helps to unify a sense of what these boys mean, what they mean for Japan and Japan's relationship to the outside world. Because of course, Japan was in a position to help. It had superior scientific technology, it had excellent doctors, it had skilled physicians with the Japanese Red Cross who were able to bring the boys to Japan and cure them of encephalitis. Cures 
maybe not the right word. Uh, Viet himself, as some of you may recall, suffered brain damage that was so severe that he never developed beyond the age of four mentally. Uh, Duke was more or less cured. The Japanese press tended to focus a lot more on Duke and on how he was developing and didn't talk much about the problems facing Viet. Part of the reason we know what happens to Viet at the time was because of the one report about this in the American press. The American press ignored this except for one thing, which was that while the boys were in uh, Japan, they had three medical staff with them. Dr. Fong, that was the head of their wing of the hospital. Dr. Fat, who was another woman, a physician, who was their attending physician. And Nurse Moi, and Nurse Moi was their main caretaker. After a couple of weeks of being in Tokyo, nurse, uh, Dr. Fat said, I have to go, I'm gonna go do some shopping. So she goes off and does some shopping and she never returns. And they're like, well, what, what happens? Uh, where'd she go? It turns out her husband had, had left Vietnam to the United States at the end of the Vietnam War. And he read in a local newspaper that she was in Japan. He had not been in touch with her in years, had not been able to see her in years. So, he contacts his congressional representative in Louisiana. They fly to Japan. They somehow get word to her in the hospital that your husband is here waiting for you. She escapes to the American embassy and then flees to America, at which point the Japanese Red Cross is panicked. And I, it's rare that I read something in a Japanese newspaper and I can see, wow, this is complete panic. You can tell like just the way that their, their statements were written. They were panicked because this threatened, of course, to create a bad relationship with Vietnam if we're getting your doctors to defect and publicly humiliate Vietnam. But of course, they can't criticize the United States because that would be a violation in many ways of the nature of the US-Japan uh, relationship. So there's fervent negotiations back and forth. Finally, Vietnam sends another doctor to replace her. The boys are taken care of, but we find out in the American report that Viet's brain damage was so severe that she didn't expect him or either boy to survive. And this is something that was not really reported in the Japanese press. Two years later, uh, the boys were back in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, once again, Viet became quite ill. Once again, it threatens to kill Duc. And the physicians said, the Je Vietnamese physicians said to the Japanese physicians, we, we can't save both of them. We're going to have to do a separation surgery that will save Duc. Can you provide support? The Japanese Red Cross thought about it and they said, we can provide support, but only if you save both boys. We don't want to be party to this if you're going to let one boy die. So this became a huge negotiation back and forth that's covered quite extensively in some of the Japanese literature from, from later on. Finally, at the end, they decided to save both boys under Dr. Fung's uh, recommendation. Both boys did survive the separation surgery, but in the aftermath of that, the damage to Viet was so severe that he, he never woke up from a co coma. He survived for the next 19 years, dying in 2007 after basically being unconscious for the previous 19 years. Duk himself survived. And the story itself was, re was regarded within Japan as a triumph, as a triumph of Japanese humanism combined with Japanese decisiveness, combined with Japanese uh, technical skill. In fact, Japanese scientists and physicians and activists even tried to create a sequel. Other activists from Shiga Prefecture raised money when Dr. Fong talked about Binchan and Tanchan, two young girls, also conjoins twins, also presumptive victims of Agent Orange. So they raised within just about a few weeks, with the encouragement of the Mainichi Shimbun, they raised uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to save these girls' lives. The very day that they announced the amounts of money they had, the two girls went into cardiac arrest and died tragically as, as infants in the hospital. And so this effort, this fledgling effort to create a sequel, a positive sequel to the story failed because Japan couldn't save, of course, all the victims of American chemical weapons. But the story would get told in more positive ways, such as uh, the, the well-known picture book by Matsutani uh, uh, Miyoko, and this book is fascinating in the way that it portrays the story of these two boys. It focuses on the two boys and their narrators, even showing, of course, the relatively ghastly human consequences of Agent Orange or dioxin use in Vietnam. 
But when Japan emerges in the story, it's often in the, in the form of guidance that Nakamura, for example, uh, comes into the story. Fujimoto, Dr. Fujimoto, come into the story in some ways explaining to these boys what happens to them, how dioxins work and so forth, which is weird because if anything, the knowledge came more from Vietnam to Japan. But the story of, again, Japanese guidance and support for the benighted people of Vietnam is so overpowering that it shapes the way in which this children's book becomes written and structured as a narrative of Japan helping Vietnam through these two boys. And I'm and not in any way dismissing this or suggesting that there's something wrong with the book. I'm suggesting rather that it fits within a larger structure of a story about Japan's relationship, post-war relationship with Asia. Um, Nguyen Duc has survived, and as many of you know, he occasionally appears on Japanese television. Just about a year ago, he spent, I think, about three months at Hiroshima Peace University as a Kyakuin Kyoju, I believe. Um, and he appears on Japanese television every once in a while, doing an interview, talking about his, his, uh, his life. He's married now. He has two adorable children. Uh, his daughter, Aindao, which means Sakura. His son, Fushi, which is Fuji. So both of his children are named after, of course, iconic Japanese phenomena that help to symbolize his relationship to Japan. And even now, for those of you who don't know them, who don't spend, haven't focused on this issue, I think you can make a pretty good case that Duk Chan is the most famous Vietnamese person among Japanese, even more so than Ho Chi Minh. Uh, his name is pretty ubiquitously known for, almost, I would think, almost any Japanese person over the age of 20 or 25. I'm not sure about younger people, but it's, it, even now, he's a well-known figure. Um, came to Japan in the aftermath of the, uh, of the Shinsai in 2011 to meet with and bring hope to the disabled victims of the disaster. Uh, there's video footage of him on NHK visiting people in Ishinomaki, for example. So in talking about emotional representation in politics, I want to point out that the Viet and Duc situation was inherently political, right? The boys were victimized by a brutal war carried out uh, in, in an imperial fashion by an overpowering military in a way that was deeply criticized even at the time, both within the United States and in Japan. The initial supporters of the boys, the boys who brought them to the attention of Japan, were doing so partly for political reasons, both to focus upon the consequences of militarism as well as the needs of the disabled, two topics that were very much central to political debate in mid-1980s Japan. Conservatives like Nakasone saw this as an opportunity to display Japan's leadership and help to the region, a benevolent humanistic form of leadership different from what the United States did. And we can see echoes of this in debates about Japan's relationship with the region for years afterwards. So the collect notions of collective concern about how we feel, how we're sorry for these boys, how we want to help these boys, about what's natural for us to do as people, as Prime Minister Nakosone said, or what's natural for us to do as Asians, as Prime Minister Nakosone said, helps to turn a political situation into a national expression of will and decency. It took an ineluctably political phenomenon and instead allowed people to unite around a shared sentiment that we're better than this, that we can help these boys. And I'm, when I talk about this, to the extent I'm being critical, I'm trying to be analytically critical in the sense that I'm trying to think about what this means. But I'm glad they did. I'm glad someone helped these boys. Had it not been for Japan's assistance, the boys probably would have died. They would have died in 1985, 1986. Had it not been for these physicians, the prime minister getting involved, these boys would have become two more victims over a decade later of the military violence that my government carried out. So I'm not in any way criticizing their activities. But I did want to think analytically about what it means when we talk about national feelings, why they become persuasive, and what it tells us about politics. Um, and with that, I'll, with that, I'll wrap up, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for listening. And if I said anything that was confusing, please let me know. I'm happy to try to clarify. I'm also happy to rethink what I said. I just can't rewrite the book because it's done, and there's not much. It's sort of, at this point, I can't really fix it. But thank you very much. Thank you.